I have to say, I didn't quite expect it to start with a scene with you on a tractor. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I think no one did. But this is, um, for me, the, the 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 magical thing about Gabin, and this is why I actually approached him because uh, when I met Gabin for the little story, I met him eleven years ago um, for a, a small pop rock festival, which I co-organized in the south of France with a friend of his. It's three of us organizing the the festival, and then each organizer brought his crew and then um, the guy called Arthur which is um, you know one of my partner brought Gabin and the first day I met Gabin he came with his camera and he was supposed to do the, the the teaser for the festival and he gave us some huge pair of headphones but I'm talking as big as this okay and he said you guys have to put the headphones and walk around the village like that um, <laughs> doing nothing else and I went is he fucking crazy? Or what? <laughs> <laughs> and this is this is when I met him. And um, very shortly after that, we did the festival. And the first after movie he did from the festival, I was very touched by the poetry in his images mm -hmm. and the way he was using completely different music than what we were watching on the screen. So we had like some punk, ba punk bands, and he just played classical music. And and you know when I approached him, I said, I absolutely love that from you. And when he, when he said to me, yeah, we're going to open the film with you on a tractor. I mean, it, it really helped because we moved my entire record collection. <laughs> but uh, we opened it on a tractor with a French classical song. I thought, wonderful. Because yeah. everybody expects, you know, for a techno film to have like a guy, you know, touching knobs and playing techno and like this. And this is, this is the power of, of his work. How long did it take you to shift all the records out? Um, not very long because we, we were quite a lot. I mean, I did. A team. I did a third <laughs> on my own, but then the rest uh, we did it. About twenty-five of us, thirty of us. Yeah. On était combien? Yes, yeah, twenty, I think. About twenty. So we did it in one day. Excellent. Good to know. It was great. It was a great <laughs> idea. I mean, he came while we were on the road. He said, "I've got a really good idea. We're gonna we're gonna film the record collection moving from one place to another." And I mean, you see it in the film. At one point, I'm like really thinking, what the hell am I going to do with all these records? And how am I going to reorganize everything? And Gabin found a solution, <laughs> which is great. One of, what, one of the things I wanted to ask you about this record collection is, do other DJs have that organizational system that you have? <laughs> do people know about this? It's, it's funny. It's, it's, a, it's a conversation we do have sometimes. It's like, how do you organize your record collection? And, and I think it says a lot on the person. You know, how, however you organize your, your books or your records or your DVD collection, only you can understand that. Do you have a bit of a love-hate relationship with it? Because I think it was DJ Cosmo, Colleen Murphy. I woke up this morning, looked at Instagram, and she said that she woke up at 5 a.m. this morning with an idea of how to organize her record collection. It seems like it's a sort of beautiful torture in a way. Mine is very organized. <laughs> very organized. Since, since yes. I know now the... Uh, it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> since, since I know now the, the, meters, the, the, you know, the meters of everything, it's done. It's sorted. <laughs> Sorted. So just to go back to what you were saying about Gavin's style being unexpected, you're obviously a DJ, an artist who's done the unexpected in his career, but also as we've seen, you're an artist that doesn't have much ego. So how did Gavin convince you to do a documentary? Oh, he didn't. I went to see him. Ah. <laughs> I actually, yeah, his, his first, I saw his first uh, after movie. 11 years ago, then he did another after movie the year after, and, and really this is when I thought, he is the right person. I mean, you have to understand, I've, I've been approached by three or four different people uh, to do a documentary, and everything what these guys wanted to do was a film about me, myself, and I, and I thought, no, this is the one thing I don't want to do is a film about myself, because without all these people in the film and then without everybody else, I'm nothing. You know, I play other people's music and they've been feeding me and helping me to become who I am with their music. So um, it was very clear that I wasn't going to do a documentary about just me. Uh, so I actually went to Gabba and I said, I know you're not into techno. I know you know nothing about techno, which is what, what excites me a lot because your vision is going to be very different. I gave in my book and then we actually uh, went on the road about six years ago. And I said, you know, would you like to come and... Um, come to a couple of parties, come with your camera, and then we'll see what we're gonna do with the footage. I mean, we, we didn't even talk about the documentary at the beginning, it was just, he came along and saw what a club looked like. Have you been to a club before? No. 
<laughs> um, came to yeah, he came to a club, and then the funny thing is the, the the little story is the first club we went together is a club in Lyon called Le Sucre, mm. and there was a couple um, that follows me everywhere, and we we actually see Clementine in the film. Henri and Clementine, yeah. Do, do you want to do you want to tell who? Yeah, they yeah. Are? Uh, it was my first time in the club of my life, and uh, <laughs> Laurent and was his last. <laughs> <laughs> Laurent was playing, and uh, I met in the in the backstage uh, Henri and Clementine, uh, who was a person of a, a certain age, uh, something like. Be very careful what you say. <laughs> <laughs> a lovely age. A lovely age, and I thought it was the the the, the parents of Laurent uh, who came to to see him. And oh, Clementine is. 76, 77, yeah. and then uh -huh. Henri is like 81 or something like that. Yeah. No, no, right. serious, Here serious. Right. And they are not my parents. <laughs> <laughs> and I understand that they are just a, a big, huge fan of Laurent, but of all the techno music. And uh, so they organize their own life to to not have uh, little children on this weekend because there is the sonar or, or time warp and they are very organized and they just say, you know, people of our age, we don't really like to have a cup of tea and play Scrabble. So we, <laughs> it's, it's our passion and they really love this music. And I find that so, so uh, the essence of what I want to put in the movie is that it's just music and it's a passion and uh, uh, passion. When, a passion. When it's talked to you, it's talked to you. And uh, so when I met them, I say to Laurent, I would like to do the movie to explain to my grandmother what is techno culture, why uh, it's interesting to know about it. If you 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 could not like this music, but it's you can always, appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, you can yeah. appreciate. So I it was the beginning of the, the of the story of our yeah. story. Yes, yeah. I think Clementine and her fellow need their own documentary next. Yeah. Wow, wow, they're, they're, amazing. We, we do have footage of them, and actually, there was one scene that we wanted to put in the film, but um, because of music, uh, because of clearance of music, we couldn't we couldn't put it unfortunately. But we can see. Her. I mean, I, I forgot that we could see her, and there's mm -hmm. a lovely image of Clementine in the film. So this is really interesting that this was your first, you know, your your entrance into dance music, making this documentary. Because what we see in the film that's so interesting is how political it was, how difficult it was in France. In France yes. To I mean, that was really interesting for me. I know about the British history, you know, the summer, the second summer of love, and the crackdown, you know, that happened with the Criminal Justice Act and all of that stuff. I didn't know about its history in France. So that was really interesting to see how you were you were the punks of that era. It was it was a very, very difficult time. I mean, France has never been a musical country like England is. And um, France was as well back then a rock and roll country. Everybody was listening to rock music and hip hop as well. But rock was huge. And then I think the people in rock music, which were uh, radio programmers, they were everywhere, you know, journalists and stuff. They felt um, a bit scared with what was what was going on in England. First of all, you got to put things back in time where there's no internet. So uh, the information comes quite slow and all the information we get in France back then is uh, ecstasy, England, craze, blah, blah, blah. And then, and then straight away, you know, criminal justice bill and stuff like that. So, so, um, some of the journalists, some of some of the people in power within the music feel this is not going to happen here. You know, they are not going to destabilize us with their new music. Music barbare. Oh, yeah. Well, on était okay, très barbare. Right? Ouais. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, so, of course, the first thing we had to say when we started was, guys, rock and roll is dead. It's time for techno. But then, yeah, then it became very, very political. And I think the, the Minister of Culture explains it really well in the documentary. Yeah, definitely. I mean, how important was it for you? We've just come out of, I feel like, the era of EDM, let's say, and the, the re-explosion of electronic music around the world, huge shows and all of this kind of stuff. Was it important to you to re-establish the link between electronic music, house and techno, with resistance, with subversion? We... I feel um, that in France we had to fight so much for such a long time. And the funny thing is we see at the end um, when they give me the medal. Um, but then again, I was telling you, 
that nobody cheers and clap in any cinema in France when they see that 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 scene because you know um, since I got that medal the government changed and the view of some politicians regarding the club culture and regarding electronic music has changed tremendously as well. And we are again, uh, like the bad, the bad people. COVID was like really hard on us and, and the French, actually the, uh, the French minister of culture, which was in, in, um, in place during COVID said some really not very nice things about us. Uh, so the question always in France is like, how do you feel now to have your medal? You know, why don't you want to give it back? I'm like, no, I'm not going to give it back because <laughs> it's true. Because once I'm proud of it, and it was a different government who gave it to me, because I I really had a dream when I was a kid, and I I did everything to get there, and um, I'm actually quite proud of what I did because I never um, um, al always did things with the right reasons. Mm. Well, I think so. Yeah. And um, and I, I, I no no no. I, I was going to go somewhere, but I'm lost. Um, no, just the what... The medal, giving it back. Yeah, and, and actually the medal allows me, when I say something, like I, I wrote a, an important letter to the, mm. to the French um, cultural minister during COVID, mm. I know because of my medal, the letter, the, the letter got read, which is good. And if I didn't have that, perhaps my letter would have gone in a bin. Mm. So it gives me a little bit more, you know, power. Okay, and it's very shiny. An impressive looking. I never wear it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I never Lost wear it. somewhere. <laughs> Lost in the record room. It's very shiny. The film is a beautiful love letter to club culture. I mean, you finished it just as the pandemic was beginning. Was there ever a point during the pandemic when you, I mean, you weren't sure where the clubs would open? I mean, it must have been very bittersweet looking at this film again. It was, it was strange because we finished the film, I think, in May. So COVID was just starting. Mm. Uh, and then after that, uh, Black Lives Matter happened and a lot of things that we're kind of, you know, quickly brush in a film came afterwards. And we felt, wow, we are quite in touch with the time. Um, but it's true that during COVID, no one wanted to be involved with this film. And it took a long time for the producer, you know, to, to get deals and stuff. And we felt that we had something wonderful. We had a film that was actually, it was the right time to show it during COVID because people were stuck at home. And we thought, wow, this is such an amazing time that we can, you know, we, we show a film about being together, live together, accepting each other. And, you know, just, it, it's quite strong. Yeah. And it took like a year and a half for us to, watch, to, to show it for the first time. And believe me, when we did the first screening in a room, everybody had the mask and stuff, but it, it was the first time we came back to a room, you know, full, full like this. Even the, the, the cinema owner was crying, saying, I haven't seen a, you know, a, a, a room full of people for like two years. And it was pretty emotional. And people were like crying in a room, going, oh, wow, we've been missing this so much. Crying and dancing in their seats. Yeah, they were, yeah. <laughs> well, they couldn't dance too much because, because the clubs were still closed, but... It, it was a weird time to uh, actually, you know, get this film together. It was a difficult time. I mean, I know you've just been talking a bit about the kind of context recently and how things have changed in France. But, I mean, when we, when we talk about the history of electronic music and club culture, you know, maybe France isn't always talked about in the same way or the same kind of on the same scale as New York or Chicago, yeah, maybe even we London. Did, we didn't export our music for a long time. Yeah, I found that really interesting to see about, for example, the importance of the Rex Club in bringing over Chicago and Detroit DJs. I thought that was really, was there a sense that you were like, I want to reestablish France's place in this history? It's funny because... Um, I say that I wasn't there for the first year, you know, for the first summer of love. Um, so I, I went to the army and then I was suffering, you know, knowing that it was happening in England and I was just stuck in some horrible place. But still I was, you know, I was DJing and I was meeting some people from London and they were telling me what was happening in England. So it was really exciting. But the first thing I wanted to do was I want to go back to England. And I came back to England after a year and then first summer of love, I've gone. And I felt like I missed the train. And I actually felt um, as I wasn't in the thing during the whole um, build up of the mm -hmm. Summer of Love, I felt um, like an outsider. 
And I actually went back to France three months after that, thinking it hasn't happened in France, so I want to be part of this thing from the inside. So I went back to France, I moved back to France, and then I fought for it in France. You know, we see you in London kind of living this double life as Batman or like a Superman. You it wasn't know, a double <laughs> life. <laughs> I was working during the day and going out at night. <laughs> Every of night. Course. So we, we see that your career sort of started in London. So it must be pretty awesome to be showing this film right here where it all began. Well, it's very special. Very, very special because I'm... I know very well at my age, I'm more towards the end of my career than the beginning. And as, as you know, my, my life as a clubber, I mean, as a young man started here, um, it's like, you know, going back in a circle and coming back to the, to the beginning. And it proves that I was right to go for it and to, you know, just, just yeah, go with it. And it's, it's very special to show it tonight here, really. Very, very special. <laughs> <laughs> Did you think you, we were going to show your film here? No. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> At the beginning, I thought if we just have one room, cinema room to show it, it's, all, it's already a dream for me. So In France? In France, in the ah, okay. little uh, village. It was <laughs> the biggest dream I had. And, uh, the first screening so, was in the village where we live. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In like a... 80, 80 people 80 capacity people. cinema. Was... And we organized it, so we got it. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, it's true. It's my first film. And when Laurent asked me the first time, do you want to go to Japan with me to maybe do a documentary about my life? I, uh, at the time, I was um, doing a corporate film. It's my job. And I was a, a delivery, a film about... A, uh, uh, he was finishing um, a film about um, uh, bathroom towels. <laughs> that bathroom was my towels. job. So, <laughs> I, no, I, I wasn't scared when I met him. I was bloody mad. <laughs> He's crazy. Really mad. He's crazy. <laughs> There's a lot of risk taking mm -hmm. as a theme that runs through this. I mean, obviously, this was your first introduction to house and techno, so you learned a lot making this film go bam. But I, I wondered, looking back at your career making this documentary, what did you learn about yourself? Uh, it's good to persevere. It's good to um, to believe in what you think and go for it. Uh, even though a lot of people are telling you it's weird or it's not good or whatever, if you really, really, truly believe in it, you you, you can actually get somewhere with it, do something with it. Um, but maybe maybe I'm wrong, but um, that's what I think, yes. Awesome. Well, it's true. <laughs> I did have one more question before I throw it out to the audience. <laughs> Was the Hacienda really... As good as everyone says it was. Yeah. I agree. Great question. It was for a time. You know, let's not, let's not lie to each other. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Um, Hacienda became absolutely amazing at the beginning of Acid House. I mean, I saw, really, I saw the Hacienda change completely uh, from being a normal club with, like, cool, funky people to being like a, a party madness place where I'm, I'm saying it, it was raining, there was so much condensation. But saying that, um, when you look at Manchester history with gangs and stuff like that, very quickly um, gangs took over because there was so much money made with drugs that um, the security was became, you know, it was actually done by gangs very, very soon. And uh, it killed the Hacienda. I mean, my last parties there were quite sad. You know, I felt what's gone wrong with this place. So I think a lot of people are very nostalgic about the place. The place ha was magic for a few years, but I think the last years were not that nice. But then as we saw, dance music culture erupted around the world, around the country. It went everywhere. Were you ever surprised by how it blew up like that? Um, I think no one ever thought that 30 years or 35 years after we would be here in a cinema watching this or, you know, we would go to, a, uh, um, a, you know, make an exhibition or 
still, you know, if you watch a lot of my old uh, interviews, I said, when I'm 40, I'll be dead. I won't be DJing anymore. I mean, now I've pushed the limit to 60. I don't want to DJ when I'm 60. But saying that, I'm going next week for Carl Cox's 60th birthday <laughs> in Ibiza. Um, so I need to stop one day, but no, I, I never, I never dare dream, you know, uh, thinking that I would be here today at my age talking to you guys and still DJing. I mean, it's, it's, it's true. It's very strange. Come on. But do you still ever feel like that young guy sticking his no, tongue out? No, my buddy tells me I'm not young anymore. <laughs> believe me. You know, I, I do feel tired. I mean, I, I absolutely love DJing. But um, it's, it's really something I love from, you know, right inside. But um, it is, it is it's, it's getting quite hard because of the age. So now I need to sleep before I go to, to play and stuff. It's true. I've learned how to deal with it. Um, but I still love it daily. But, you know, when you, think about the situation. If, if ever I get a taxi tomorrow and I start having a talk with him, and a guy looks at me and he obviously sees I'm not 25 anymore. And he goes, oh, what's your job? I'm a techno DJ. <laughs> just, just think the reaction I get. <laughs> no, it's, it's difficult sometimes. <laughs> but, and maybe this is a good place to end before I throw it out to you all, but in, we still see that clubs manage to still excite you. You know, you're going to Bassiani and Tbilisi in Georgia, but the cl clubs and parties still have the capacity to move you. To be to excite you. Absolutely, 100%. I mean, if it didn't move me, I would have stopped a long time ago. Um, I, I, you've seen quite a lot of my team in this film, but I have a great team who know how much I'm um, dedicated to this. And I've always told them the day you feel that, you know, uh, either I'm getting rusty or I get dusty or, or I get tired or there's anything wrong, we need to have a proper conversation and then I will need to stop. So um, for me, pleasure is the only, only thing that drives me. So I absolutely love playing in clubs. I love it, it's wonderful. Pleasure is the thing that drives It's such you. a nice thing, come on, it's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs>
So the poor person next to me is just like that. It's not very much fun. And then as well, when I DJ, I play very long hours. And the people who usually travels with me has aged as well. Um, and I think it's quite unfair to ask your, your, the person who's traveling with you to say, uh, by the way, I've done a four hour set, but don't worry, I'll do another two hours, you know, because can I, can I just do a bit more? And, you know, I play long hours and it's, I think it's difficult and quite boring for someone to come and wait all night, um, wait for me to finish and, and travel with me without me being such a, a nice people, a nice person to travel with because I work all the time. So very quickly I decided to, um, you know, just to travel on my own. And my, my agent, Christian, back then just went, hmm, that's great, I'm very happy with that. <laughs> it's cool, I can be with my wife every weekend, it's lovely. <laughs> how, so, um, yeah. how do you recover from one of those marathon sets though? Are you just like, putting on a Stranger Things box set and just kind of... I, I always carry enough records to play for like three weeks. So um, don't worry. No, no, I have enough music always with me, always. Do you have like a cup of tea when you get in and just find it? I actually do sometimes. <laughs> it's true, there's a couple of clubs where they know when I get there at three o'clock in the morning, here's your tea. <laughs> Everybody else is like, you know, off it, like I'm going crazy and I'm having a cup of tea before I go and DJ. But I, I, yeah, I do that. I can do that. The good shit. Very strange, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I was at uh, Astropolis last week, which is a huge festival in Brittany. It was amazing when you see what's happening at the festivals, like the name festival, that there is some new clubs opening. I think the scene is amazing. We have amazing producers, a lot of uh, small um, um, gangs of people uh, doing small labels and making amazing music. France hasn't been as healthy um, for, I mean, France wasn't very, great for a long time, but I think the last 10 years has been amazing. Really, there's a lot of stuff. There is a lot of stuff. And now we don't have to always look at what's happening outside or to envy what's happening outside because we do have a wonderful scene. I, th I think so. The question is, would I listen to House and Techno? Or oh, I well, think, let's go you know, I mean, I mean when I see... <laughs> When I see the generation, the young generation in France, they're really into French <laughs> rap, actually. No, 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 they're really into some, I mean, the, the rap scene in France has always been quite interesting uh, because um, France is the second country after America for hip hop. And for the last 10 years, because of actually English drill and trap and stuff like that, the, the French rap scene has completely changed and it's amazing what's going on now. There's a lot of really, really interesting um, artists. So I, I might be listening to that as well as perhaps house and techno, but uh, I think I might be more into drill and trap, perhaps. But I don't know, I'm not 18, can't answer. <laughs> maybe, maybe a future album idea. Well, I, I mean, yeah, collaboration would be fun. <laughs> I have a little question to Gabin, if that's, if that's okay. Um, Gabin knew nothing about techno, and um, the great thing is when he said, you know, if we do, um, if we talk about Detroit, it'd be nice to get some people from Detroit or whatever, and, and so, of course, I, I organized interviews for him, and, and then he went on his own to do the interviews. Um, who... Who was the person that, that uh, impressed you the most? Because you, you didn't know any of them. So is there one person that, that stood out for you that you met? Uh, a lot, but Jeff Mills <laughs> was... <laughs> a cat. He's playing in London tomorrow. Yeah, I, yes, I saw. Yeah, Jeff Mills, it was really, really um, a great experience for me because uh, I, I understood that he was a, a, a huge artist, and you mm. talk about me, uh, you talk a lot about him. And uh, we, we do the interview in the Salle Playel, which is a, a huge uh, decorum, really impressing. And the guy, Jeff, is very elegant, very charismatic, like a, a cat. And uh, <laughs> I was... Yeah, he's like a cat. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I, agree. I agree. Really he's like a cat. so... So elegant and so, I don't know the word, but he's really, uh, he, he impressed me a lot. And uh, it was one of the 
first uh, interview uh, I made, and uh, I understood very quickly that my first question is saying, Ooh, <laughs> with this guy, why, why I do the interview? Because I was not uh, uh, a specialist about techno, so it was a big lesson for me, and I choose to say, okay, Jeff, um, I knew nothing about techno, I so know I, nothing. I know nothing about techno. Uh, I don't try to 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 bullshit you. To, to bullshit you. <laughs> so just Laurent uh, give me his confidence, and uh, I would like to to know uh, to, and to learn about you. And after that, the interview was really great, and it was a, a great uh, uh, experience for me as a young uh, re uh, director. I learned a lot. So uh, thank you, Jeff, again to. <laughs> do this interview for me. All right. <laughs> I feel like that's a lovely place to end. And I love that you see in the film his artistry. You know, it's really about what he's doing. is his wizardry on that 909. Oh, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Everyone, can we have... I feel like we've had a lot of rounds of applause and that's so excellent, but can we, can we have one more? Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Merci.